We're going to start off nice and basic for the gospel today. Um, the father, who clearly represents God, has two sons. He says, hey, hey kids, go, go to work today. Do something good today. The first son says no, but then changes his mind and does it. The second guy says, yes, father, but doesn't follow through. So on the simplest level, this gospel is saying that it's never too late to do the right thing. All right? God doesn't seem to have any problem with us saying no and then changing our mind and doing the right thing in the end. So should we do the right thing from the very beginning? Yeah, obviously. But it would seem that doing the right thing when it really counts is the way to get God's attention. And the time it takes you to get to that point, that's something that God doesn't care about quite so much. God understands that sometimes we need time. So thinking about that for a little while, I realized that this is a fine opportunity in the spirit of this gospel to share something with you a little more advanced. And that thing to share with you is something to consider the next time you're wondering whether a sin is venial or mortal. That is to say, a serious sin in need of a priest in penance. So the next time you're in that pondering place, feel free to ask yourself this question. Can I easily change my mind and undo the damage of my sin like the first brother in the gospel? Or did I do something that cannot be undone? Because if the answer is, yeah, I did something and I did lasting, permanent damage, well, then there's a greater likelihood that we're talking about a serious sin in need of confession. Now, allow me to be clear, this is not the definition of a mortal sin. I am just offering this to you as a means to better understand yourself and the moral state that you may find yourself in someday. It is a tool to be used in the future. So, let's get into some concrete examples. What exactly am I talking about? I can think of no finer example than the church's stance on pro-life on pro-life. That is what I'm talking about more than anything else. Because whether we're talking about the unborn, the elderly, or the, the, the criminals and the marginalized, taking a human life is a big deal. And part of the reason that the church says what it does is that when a person commits to that action, you know, regardless of the circumstances, the reasons, or the intentions, when a person commits to that action and takes a life, that life is over forever, okay? You are not free to take back the decision later on in life. You can't say, I said no to God at first, but now I've changed my mind. You can't do that anymore. You can't be the first son in the gospel who changed his mind and did the right thing in the end. Once you take life into your own hands, you will never know what might have been had you made a different choice. That is what it means to do something that cannot be undone. And the people, plenty of people, discover that when it's far too late. And for those people, forgiveness, mercy, and healing absolutely can still be theirs. I am not denying that. It can be theirs. However, it's going to be a longer process. And it is going to require some personal conviction of change. That does have to happen if permanent, lasting damage is in play. All right. For fear of sounding a little judgmental, let's balance it out with a Father Justin shame story. Don't worry, I've got plenty of them. How many of you have a sibling? How many of you have an annoying sibling? Okay, way more than 930 Mass. Like, apparently, there are only, like, four annoying siblings in all of Barton, if that mess is to be believed. Yeah, lies, I know. So, um, this may shock you, but uh, I, growing up, was not the greatest older brother in the world. Uh, growing up, there were three of us, me, the middle child, my sister, and then my, my younger baby brother. And the real problem I'm going to get to is with my sister. 
my brother, my brother could handle it, all right? For the most part, my brother deserved the pummelings I gave him. <laughs> He's the annoying brother. It's just, it's ridiculous. Take my word for it, I'm a priest. That is a true statement. To this day, I am still angered and annoyed by leprechauns because of him. <laughs> it's a long story, long Weird, annoying story, but it involves my brother doing an impersonation of a leprechaun for like hours at it. At, it's, he did real psychological damage to me that day. Anyway, but what I'm getting to is with my brother, brothers are like that sometimes, all right? He would drive me nuts, I would drive him nuts, and we would fight, and then we'd get on with our lives. With my brother, it was always easy for us to be that first son in the gospel. Um, we never really did that much lasting damage to one another because all of our fighting never overcame the connection and the togetherness we have always had as brothers. It is comical how little we've changed in, some way, in, in, in that way. Like, he lives in Denver these days, and he just came home because his wife um, had a uh, wedding to attend here in Wisconsin. So we were hanging out at home for my, uh, my Aunt Kelly's birthday party, and I come in the door, I'm one of the last to arrive, and my brother and I, we, we, we just knew that we couldn't give our, each other a hug like normal people. So across the room, we make eye contact with each other, and then we, we hiked up our pants as far as they could go, and then we squatted down and did like this frog hop hug. <laughs> the rest of the family definitely wanted to pummel us both for being so annoying and obnoxious. My point being, we have always been together as brothers. With my sister, the middle child, it was different. My sister didn't deserve the pummelings the way my brother did. And it's because siblings are not all the same. I was, in a way, treating my sister in the same way I treated my brother. And looking back on my childhood, I was just mean. I was mean for no reason. I'm not sure if you know how that feels when you look back and you're like, wow, what exactly was I thinking? How was that a good idea? And I did real mean things, and I didn't really understand that. Not until I got into high school, where my sister was still in middle school, that's when I started piecing things together and realizing that I did real lasting damage to her that no apology or good deed could undo. I couldn't say sorry and buy her a new toy and expect everything to be fine. No, 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 no. I was not like the first son in the gospel. I was like the second son. I said, yeah, and I wanted to do good things, but didn't really follow through with the actions. And that's a sobering thought if you've ever been at that point. Now, my sister and I are better these days. I promise. I promise that to be true. But it took time. It took time and something real had to change. Something in here. I had to turn back to God. I had to be a different kind of older brother. Would not have worked otherwise. That kind of change is possible in life, and sometimes it is very necessary. Like when you do real lasting damage in the world that cannot be easily undone. I'll wrap up with a simple conclusion. In our gospel today, we read that we can say no to God and then change our minds later. God will understand. Because our salvation does not operate on the, uh, on the level of, of, of one brainless moment in college or one moment of weakness here or there. No. Our salvation is our entire life and beyond. So no matter what you've done, no matter what regrets you might be dealing with now, <laughs> the door to heaven is still open. We can say yes to God today, no matter how many times we said no to him yesterday. <laughs>